Okay, we'll, we'll start the questions and answers, and, um, and we've divided it into uh, categories, and um, I think we'll start with Dr. Miller has got a few sort of general questions, um, uh, and um, I'll, I'll ask each of the people addressing the question primarily to come up front, to come up to the podium, because we're videotaping this. It's another thing I want to remind people of. We're videotaping all of these talks, and eventually, it will all go up on our website. I think people know it can take us a while because we're just editing it ourselves and doing it on our own, but it will get there. And you could look at it again and show your relatives and friends if you like. Um, so that's why we want the speakers to come up here to answer their questions, starting with Dr. Miller, um, so that we can see as well as hear them. Come on up, Dr. Miller. You have some questions to answer? Well, I have a lot of different kinds of questions. I was going to the audience decide. Okay. Well, you can, you can, you know, so uh, he's going to be up in a minute, and he will repeat what he said. <laughs> it was just a logistical question. <laughs> Thanks. And make sure to put, your, put, your, uh, put the microphone right next to your face. Okay. Well, I'm going to be political and not start with the political questions. So, can, can you hear me okay? Uh, so I'm going to be political, and I'm not going to start with the political questions. Uh, for some reason, I was given all the, the tough questions about politics. So I'll, I'll get to them. Uh, is it, what is the relationship between heart disease and Alzheimer's? Uh, we think it's important. Uh, we think uh, vascular disease of the brain can trigger the Alzheimer pathways. We think that vascular disease of the brain can add to the burden of Alzheimer's disease. So it's pretty clear that people who have uh, vascular disease of the brain only need a little bit of the Alzheimer proteins to start get, getting symptomatic. Whereas if you uh, can avoid uh, heart and uh, brain vascular disease uh, as you age, it really diminishes probably about threefold the likelihood that you will get a degenerative disease of the brain. So incredibly important. Some of the proteins that aggregate associated with vascular disease like fibrin, uh, Dr. Acosaglu at the Gladstone has shows uh, it may be important in the Alzheimer pathway. So unbelievably important. Bruce, yeah. Probably worth mentioning the public health stuff you talked about. Yeah, so what does that mean to all of us? And I'm in this category here. Uh, if you have untreated diabetes, it increases the likelihood that you will get uh, degenerative disease uh, threefold, get your diabetes treated. If you had high blood pressure, two to threefold likelihood that you will have uh, problems with thinking as you get older. Uh, get your blood pressure in the low, uh, medium range. Uh, if you get head trauma, major risk for Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, um, probably uh, uh, what the football players have gotten, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, um, and probably psychiatric disease as well. So uh, wear helmets, protect your kids from sports that uh, will allow them to get hurt and uh, have their brains injured when they're young. What could be worse than that? So uh, anyways, uh, that's, that's my little public health uh, message today. Is there a test that can determine a, a medical diagnosis for Alzheimer's disease? Uh, we're getting pretty good at it. Uh, I think we're in, uh, and, and let me uh, say a little bit more about this. I think Julio talked in a, in a pretty clear way about this as well. So if you have amyloid protein in the brain, we think that uh, if you, uh, this is a huge risk factor for developing symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. We know uh, after the age of 70, maybe 20% of us have amyloid who are doing perfectly fine. Uh, but those people who have amyloid in the brain are much more likely to progress to a dementia. Uh, so we think the amyloid protein is a pretty good marker and predictive marker. Uh, if you have amyloid and tau together, I think we have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. So I, I, I think uh, the tau correlates with your symptoms. As Julio said, if you have tau in the hippocampus, you will have memory problems. Um, so I, I think 
we have uh, outstripped our treatment abilities with diagnosis. Our diagnostic ability, even down to the molecules that are in the brain, has gotten really good. But uh, we have to have really good preventions in the same way that your family doctor, when you show high cholesterol, has a cholesterol lowering compound. We need tau lowering compounds, amyloid lowering compounds, and I think we really are on the verge of, of that. So diagnosis will go along with treatment. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, what are the ethical implications in a clinical trial? Here's some of the politics stuff. Um, uh, when some of the participants only receive placebo. Yeah, well, I, I, I think this is really important. And I think our trials unit, uh, Adam, Julio, Richard, Sai, think about this differently than the pharmaceutical industry does. So they uh, constantly, uh, when they're working with a pharmaceutical company, saying, we need, after the trial is over, our placebo group to get drug. More expensive for the pharmaceutical company, but uh, I think it's really important. The other thing that uh, our trials group does is they, they try to design studies where two-thirds or three-quarters of the people get the drug. We need placebo. Uh, we don't want people getting drugs that aren't going to help them and maybe even make them worse. But uh, I think this is the way we try to, to grapple with this. Um, it's hard. It's really hard. And it's to do it in the most ethical way costs a lot of money. And this is where sometimes the pharmaceutical companies uh, push back. Uh, OK, and then I got about five questions about the new administration and funding for brain research. Um, OK. Uh, me. They, ga they gave me these questions. Uh, OK. Um, uh, we don't know. Uh, our Alzheimer budget went from about 500 million to uh, close to a billion uh, in the last years of the Obama administration. President Obama was uh, uh, an advocate uh, for brain research, probably more than anyone in the whole Congress or Senate. He, for some reason, really believed in this, and I don't really know why. Um, uh, we, I think that we're, we don't know what this new administration will do. Uh, there's a physician that is uh, Mike Price that is leading the um, uh, health uh, administration that oversees the NIH. Um, uh, he's talked about cuts uh, in cancer research. Um, uh, I think it's, um, well, you know what I think. I don't even have to tell you what I think. I, I, I think. We think it's all to but, but, yeah. Uh, one thing I've learned in San Francisco, uh, and I think we had the nice slide about the mosquito from Karen as well, we can all make a difference. We must uh, continue, you know, Republican, Democrat, you name it, to talk to the people that we know and tell them how important this research is. You know, I think it would be a shame if we had cutbacks uh, when we're just on the verge of therapies that will tr really, I think, transform the whole aging process, transform society. So. Uh, we're, we will cope with this, um, whatever it is, and I think it will make philanthropy more important. So I think constantly about that. Um, in terms yeah. of advocacy, yeah. Alzheimer's Association and AFTD? So lo lots of ways you can advocate. I think, you know, one of the best ways is if you know uh, somebody who uh, is close with our, our new president or, or the new um, administration. Um, uh, so uh, that, that's the most powerful. I think the Alzheimer's Association is important, um, uh, the AARP, you name it. But we believe in science. I think we do it in this country better than anywhere else in the world, uh, partly because we've been well funded. I think if we lose funding, I think this is going to have an impact on, on us and ultimately our economy because uh, I think a lot of these brilliant scientists are generating you know, new uh, funding for uh, pharmaceutical agents, et cetera. So I think it's bad business, but okay, I've said enough. Um, why is this room predominantly Caucasian? 
Um, I think it's uh, definitely a story and research period. It's something um, uh, that we have to overcome. I think if you put out a flyer, you know, or put out a newspaper ad, you know, 95% of the people that uh, come uh, are Caucasian. Uh, I think as Karen emphasized, Howie and uh, his uh, Asian outreach team have taught us, we must go to these communities, African American communities, uh, um, Latino communities, um, and I think for the first time we really have the uh, people, Karen, Sergio, a number of others, um, and the funding to do this right. So I think this will change, but it won't change if we're passive about it and just, you know, take whoever comes in. That will continue this, and I think we really need uh, the multicolored populations that we have in the Bay Area in our research. They teach us it all in different ways about susceptibility, risk, uh, new therapies. So, uh, yes, we are working on this. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> apparently, Robin wants to answer some questions. <laughs> You want to, what, what's uh, your category? Great. Uh, you're going to help me with these. Though. I am. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I got a few few questions on uh, MRI findings, just to take it out of the political realm. And uh, so a couple of people asked if they will get the results of their amyloid scans if they've had one. And the answer is yes. It depends. It, it depends. Right. <laughs> So, so it, it's a tough question. So I, I think the thing is, as Dr. Miller said, um, you can have amyloid and be just fine. And although the risk is increased uh, that you'll have problems over time, we don't know how much or when those risks will take effect. And in truth, it's, it's an open question for us as to what an amyloid finding means when you're not having any symptoms and doing fine. So we're very cautious about handing out that information without a really deep level of education. And so if somebody asks, can I have my amyloid images, the way I answered it now is the way I answer it to those individuals. Well, let's talk about it. Why do you want your amyloid imaging? What is it, you know, what is it going to tell you? What do you think it's going to tell you? And often when we go through that process, people say, well, I guess maybe I don't want to know. And if they do want to know, we have a way to potentially um, tell them. There's a little bit, sometimes our hands are a bit tied because the sponsors of the study or the leaders of the study and we're just participants restrict us from doing it. It depends on the study. So our policy has been, if we know you're symptomatic, you have significant memory problems or Alzheimer's disease, then we think we understand what the amyloid imaging means and we uh, feel very strongly that if you want to know that, we tell you the information. For people who have no symptoms, we try to go through the individualized process I just said to make sure that if we're going to provide that information, we provide it with the appropriate context. There's a big debate among even you know, clinicians and scientists about what the right approach is. I don't think there is a, a single right approach. This is the way we handle it. And uh, I think that covers it. There was something else I was going to say, but I forgot. Okay. <laughs> and then um, kind of ta tagging on to uh, William and Daphne's uh, documentary, um, a question about how how or what tips can you give in regards to redirecting someone? Um, and I think uh, they touched on that a little bit and the film sort of showed a little bit of the way that the, their families deal with certain, you know, uh, maybe difficult things or things that aren't going quite the same as they were before. So redirection, just for people who don't know what that is, it's a, it's a technique that's used in uh, the care and management of people who have cognitive problems. And because of those cognitive problems, they may have behavioral changes that make them feel more agitated or irritable. And it may be hard for their family members to um, deal with it. Um, one of the examples given in the film was repetitive questioning and what do you do about that. And so redirection is one of the techniques that's long been used to try to, uh, basically the, the, the goal of it is to sort of change the subject, um, especially if it's a subject that someone's stuck on or it's a difficult subject. 
So there are a variety of different techniques that uh, we recommend at our center. We have a group of nurses here where we meet one-on-one -on -one with patients and, we, and their families, and we try to work out what works best for each individual person. But sometimes it can be changing the um, subject of a conversation. It can be moving on to a different activity. It can be changing the environment a little bit, like going for a walk or using some other pleasurable activity to sort of move out of a less pleasurable subject. So there are a lot of different techniques. I think it's something that works best if you can kind of um, maybe individualize it and talk to somebody who knows the, the person really well um, to try and work out some strategies around that. Um, and, is, and kind of on that topic, is there a behavioral training in lieu of drugs that can help. And absolutely, that's absolutely the case. In, uh, for families who are dealing with these kinds of problems, behavioral changes can be some of the most difficult um, issues. And as I mentioned, the nurses and social workers here work very uh, constantly on dealing with a, a sort of creative care plan for each patient. I think what it really comes down to is being really creative and individualized with every person. The, as we mentioned before, the Alzheimer's Association, our website, um, there's a, a website for the Family Caregiver Alliance. There's a lot written about behavioral interventions. And it's good to read about that because I think Sometimes it's hard to even know where a problem is coming from, and it really helps to dig down and try to figure out what the actual problem is and where, where the root of that problem might be. And that helps to, to provide a roadmap to how, to how to intervene with that. But usually these kinds of interventions are based in, in uh, changes to the environment or changes in communication style or changes within a caregiver or a family around what the symptoms mean, how important are they, how much is it, how important is it to fight a particular symptom. So um, once again, I wanna make sure that people know there are other resources out there and our team here is really, really involved and interested in this subject. So if you have other questions, more specific questions, please let me know. Do you have any other categories you wanna address? Or I'm driving. You could well, we could do it one okay. minute. Okay, and I'm going to have one minute on driving, which is, you know, plenty of time to talk about that. Um, uh, why do we sometimes recommend that people stop driving? And um, <laughs> so it, that's also a, a little bit uh, complicated, but there is a there is a, a law in California that says that physicians uh, and others who uh, identify or diagnose a patient with a particular disease like dementia are required to report that to the Department of Public Health and they work in concert with the Department of Motor Vehicles to assess people's driving. There's a lot of bureaucracy around this and forms and uh, things that go back and forth between physicians and these departments um, and our role in that is to really because we try to be very, very careful about how we diagnose these problems, we try to be really correct in our diagnosis and we try to be very mindful about how we approach this very sensitive issue. So we are, part of our role is as, um, in the public health realm is to follow these procedures that have been outlined for us. And uh, I think even a bigger part is that our role as a provider is to communicate very clearly, as clearly as we can, what we think the problems are, why we're making these recommendations, what people can expect as an outcome. Um, it's a very difficult loss. I realize that, and we all realize that. And I think we try to be as sensitive as we can to this. Um, it is part of our role um, as providers um, to, to follow through on these kinds of recommendations. So, uh, should we do a little on prevention? Joel, that's your stuff. So uh, 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 Dr. Kramer hasn't spoken. Uh, this this uh, um, 
uh, uh, session, uh, to, but he's spoken many times before. He's the head of our neuropsychology group and very interested in aging and the transition between aging and having some trouble. And a lot of the questions about prevention really sit in that area. So that's why usually he's the guy who answers questions around prevention. Good morning. Thanks again for coming in. Um, how he used the term transition earlier, speaking of transitions. So probably most people in the room have at some point met Ken Edwards. Ken, are you still here? Uh, he's a stand-up. He's a stalwart in the Alzheimer's Center. And he was so inspired by so many of our retired subjects that he's chosen to retire himself. So we'll definitely miss him. Um, also, a couple of the research coordinators in the Normal Aging Program, Rowan Sloaner and Jordan Stiver, have gotten into graduate school, so they'll be leaving this summer, but we promise to replace them with people just as smart and just as nice. Um, so, questions. So there's one question about, so if you're in the Normal Aging Program and you start to decline a little bit, what happens? What do we do? Do we kick you out? Do we, uh, and the answer is of course not. We, uh, when we find any sort of change, whether it's related to a neurodegenerative disease or cerebrovascular disease, or we even find an incidental tumor on a scan, we sit down with you, we, uh, with your permission, we send all the information to your primary care physician, we do whatever it takes to make sure that your care is optimal. And if there's any kind of hint of cognitive decline uh, and related to cerebrovascular or neurodegenerative disease, uh, we uh, would hope we could try, we refer you to our clinic and we'll keep you in research for uh, forever if that's something that you want to do and continually following you, uh, whether it's in the aging program or the Alzheimer's Center, uh, but we will continue to uh, you know, be committed to uh, you know, optimizing your care for forever. Um, so there were sort of a lot of questions on how to really sort of optimize uh, aging and lots of fairly specific ones. And I thought I would do some sort of general comments that will hopefully address as many questions as possible. So two general principles to think about. I mean, again, our goal is to prevent cognitive decline. And there, you know, what we're realizing is that, that there are numerous, multiple small effects that impact changes in our, uh, and how age impacts our brain structure and function. Uh, and, you know, so there are a couple different kinds of effects. So we want to be able to think about ways of reducing the likelihood of getting the pathologies in the first place. So thinking about ways of preventing amyloid aggregation and tau aggregation in your brain. But the other thing that these small effects and behaviors can do is to maintain, your, your, increase your resilience to the pathology that's there, all right? So these are two general approaches that we think about to uh, improve brain health. Um, there are a couple of things that we're really focusing our energies on over this next year. Uh, now, we definitely want biomarkers that are very, very sensitive to early disease and early cognitive change. And it turns out that cerebral spinal fluid, which is a terrific way of telling what's going on in the brain, uh, of course, requires a lumbar puncture. And it turns out it's not all that popular. Uh, I don't know why. Um, so we are aggressively pursuing ways of capturing and measuring cere you know, central nervous system proteins using blood, and there are a couple of very sort of innovative and creative ways of doing that, and also with more advanced molecular imaging. So we are, I think our very first tau scan was done a week ago in the normal aging cohort. And as Dr. Miller alluded to earlier, uh, tau is going to be one of those key brain proteins that's going to give us, a, uh, along with amyloid, a real uh, you know, idea of what's, what's happening. Um, 
you know, we're also exploring things like the, like microbi the microbiome to see what's happening in the gut. The other area that we're aggressively pursuing is understanding better the behaviors that help improve brain health. And we're doing a lot in this next year to look at cognitive training, not just to see whether cognitive and training proves cognition, but to see if there is a direct impact on, on neuronal integrity and brain structure and function associated with, with cognitive training. So you'll be hearing more about those trials. And of course, diet. And there were several questions about diet. You know, we're thinking about, you know, it's caloric restriction or long fasting periods, a way to improve brain health. There's certainly plenty of support for that, but we'd like to uh, carry out some trials. And there are certainly questions about things like supplements and sugar in the diet and what impact that has. And yeah, um, you know, there's not an impressive literature on supplements and vitamins, but as I think Dr. Miller alluded to earlier, we know that diabetic risk, even if you don't even have diabetes, diabetic risk um, is associated with poor cognitive trajectories. So to the extent to which high sugar diets are associated with, uh, you know, hyperglycemia, uh, you know, that I think those sorts of dietary changes are really key. Um, and sleep is one of those other behaviors that uh, actually very likely not only affect cognition from moment to moment, we all do poorly with a bad night's sleep, but we're realizing that chronic poor sleep may be associated with increased amyloid uh, aggregation, which again is one of those proteins that's associated with Alzheimer's disease. So we're really struck by how all these you know, small effects are, are so interconnected and associated with inflammation and, and a whole host of other factors that imp impact brain functioning. So um, if, there, if I have one more minute, there are a couple of specific questions about things like uh, alcohol and chemotherapy. And again, things that like that may be, are, are, I think are, well, you know, alcohol is a neurotoxin. So that's uh, no question about that. And excessive alcohol assumption is poor, for, bad for your brain. Small amounts of alcohol have been associated in, in uh, epi studies with actually adequate cognition. And we all know that red wine is loaded with antioxidants, which might be good for your brain. Uh, no, no product endorsement there. Um, uh, and, um, and I think I'll stop because that's, that's the signal I'm getting from Lisa. So again, thank you all very much for your continued support and participation. So, uh, and, and if you guys want to visit the uh, Kramer Vineyards up uh, in Napa. I'm sure he'd be happy to give you a tour of the caves and all that. So, um, I, I know, I know. I just wanted to, so I, I like to be very concrete about this area of, rec of, of um, uh, you know, sort of behaviors and, and supplement, supplements Dr. Miller's going to talk about. But I, I just want to be clear, you know, there's a lot of information out in the world about, you know, uh, cognitive things and exercises that may or may not help your brain and physical exercise and whether it helps your brain. So I think mostly the reason Joel talked about it in the way he did is there's still a lot of science to be figured out about exactly how, how all that works. But I do like to kind of at least let you walk away with a few concrete things. So a heart healthy diet we, we believe now is a brain healthy diet. I know there's a lot of debate about exactly what the healthiest diet for your heart is. But I think in general the recommendations around low and saturated fats, keeping your calorie count low, and if there's any specific diet that has the best data, it's probably the Mediterranean diet, although it's probably not the only one that helps. So that's the diet story. Beyond that, there's no data on special other things. Dr. Mills can talk about this more. So that's the diet. Heart healthy diet, that's a brain healthy diet. In terms of exercise, we don't exactly know how much or how little, but it, I tend to recommend what the American Heart Association recommends, which is 150 minutes a week of moderate physical activity. So where you get a little sweaty and you're breathing heavy, that's moderate. Well, one time I actually made a mistake and said 150 minutes a day. That's too much. <laughs> You don't need to do that. 150 minutes a week is the recommendation. M one day we may modify that. I don't think any amount is too little if it's really exercise. And a little bit more than that, of course, is great. But that's a good number to shoot for. And in terms of alcohol, probably one serving, like one glass of wine, one beer, 
per day is sort of the right number, we think now. Certainly no more than two, and maybe even a little less on average than one a day is probably the right number. Um, and in terms of mental exercises, there's a lot of research trying to figure out if there's anything special, but essentially we believe that keeping your mind active in general is a good idea. There's, most of that data comes from studies that consider anything that you might do out in the community or on your own to keep your mind active as good. So crossword puzzles, if you like them, great. Took on the political questions, I'm gonna get some booze probably here, but uh, anyways, I thought I'd be brave. Supplements. Um, you know, uh, Howie's talking about things that have really been proven in epidemiology, uh, in prospective studies, uh, diet, exercise, lowering uh, uh, blood pressure. This is science. This is real. This is really important. The supplement field. Uh, I think is filled with charlatans, uh, filled with people that are making money off of you uh, as you get older. Uh, you know, I think the likelihood that taking 32 vitamins or even uh, three vitamins with no scientific proof uh, that it will, there's one thing that's scientifically proven there you will uh, lose money in this process, uh, right? <laughs> that, that's proven. Beyond that, I think this is religion. I, I trust religion, we all have our beliefs, but uh, there isn't a lot of proof uh, for uh, many of the religions. And, uh, and I feel really sad when I see one of my patients come in uh, who is spending um, down a lot of their retirement money on completely unproven uh, you know, uh, ways of uh, treating cognitive disorders. If your B12 is uh, too low, yeah, you gotta get treated. If your folate uh, levels are low, different. But just to, you know, take supplements because somebody wants to make money off it or someone believes in it, I would say avoid them. So that's my opinion. Okay, I agree. Um, the, maybe we'll do genetics and then we'll wind it up with, um, oh, actually other, other diversity questions too that you have? Okay, so we'll do, I think there's only a couple of genetics questions, so why don't you come on, Joanne, then we'll do a little more on diversity and then we'll finish up with trials and treatments. Other treatments, go ahead. All right, so the first question <clears throat> I was gonna take on is if only 1% of dementia is directly caused by genetics, what has changed in the environment to explain the 30% increase seen in dementia? So a few clarifying points. Um, my example in the slides of the 1% was specifically for Alzheimer's. It's a little different if we look at other diagnoses. For example, with frontotemporal dementia, about 20% are caused by that major one change um, that then can be inherited through the family. So it really does depend on the diagnosis. But just in general, why are we seeing more dementia? And I think the answer is really that we are an aging population. If you go back to 1900, the average lifespan was about age 46. You know, this is before antibiotics, um, before treatments for cancer, before a lot of lifestyle changes that we've made. Now we're, our average lifespan is getting into the late 70s. So it's testing our brains to see how well they do as we live many more years. And that's really the, the reasoning behind so much more dementia rather than anything specific in the environment that has changed. Um, just a along those lines, kind of in the same category as Pick's disease inheritable. Pick's disease is one of the uh, more common names for frontotemporal dementia. So yes, we would say about 20% is due to one major gene change, um, but a lot, probably 50% is that just sporadic where there's only been one person in the family and we really need to study these more minor gene changes and environmental influences that probably cause that. Uh, my husband has BVFTD. As a research participant, he has been tested and has no genetic markers. However, what are the chances new markers will be uncovered? Thinking of our children, which you know, obviously many of us do. Um, so I think it's, it's really important that even though there may not be one of those three main genes um, that has been found, there are many other 
genetic predispos predisposing genes that may be contributing. Um, we always recommend that people stay in tune with what we're doing, um, take a look at our website once in a while, come to these. We think we've found most of the major genes that are accounting for um, behavioral variant FTD, but we are never, we never say never. Um, there still could be something out there waiting to be discovered, but we do think that we've, we've seen most of what, what is out there. Per Howard Rosen, studies are focused on three FTD major genes. Um, if research participants do not have one of these three genes, how are they helping research? So I think that's a great question. Um, it really, we need to explore what's happening in, in everybody else, so the 80% that don't have one of these genes, um, and that's where you're really helping out, is what are these other factors, um, and what can we learn to help, help that, that prediction in the future. And, and lastly, I think this sort of ties everything together, is how will this whole genome type of testing um, be manifest and shared with us in the future? And I think right now, and again, genetics is always changing. Um, next year we're gonna be saying something different. But right now, we're looking at big populations of people and trying to understand what these minor changes might mean in the hopes that someday we're gonna have a really precise calculation to say you have these genetic factors, you have these environmental factors, that's gonna put you in this risk category and we need to do this type of surveillance. And then maybe think about this treatment if you're in the high risk category. Um, so right now, we don't, I, don't, I don't think we, we are at the point where we have individual things to share with people, but we're trying to gather all this information together to better understand what those 30,000 different genes mean um, and how that's gonna help us predict risk in the future and get the treatments and cures to the right people. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thanks. I, I just wanted to add a couple of things uh, to, to that. Thanks, Joanne. Is, uh, one thing people should know is that Artful is not only focusing on those three major genes, but um, there's a component of it that's focusing on anybody with a strong family history suggesting they might have a gene, uh, an, a major change in their genetics. And uh, we uh, uh, you know, are doing our best to see if we can discover the gene in families like that. You know, we, we think maybe we found all the big ones, but we're not really sure, and that's one of the goals of that study. In addition, I think the way I think of this is that, you know, if you have a major gene, we understand that that's going to have a big impact, one of these big changes. But uh, what we now believe is that, you know, there are a lot of genes where it's normal to have version A or version B or version C, or if you have another minor change, that's okay too, because the pro, you know, the body can interpret that and know to make the right proteins anyway. But what we're starting to think is that you can but kind of add up those risks and then subtract some. So in other words, if, if it turns out there's 50 or 60 different genes that are relevant to whether somebody might get Alzheimer's or FTD, that these 30 are good and these 30 are not so good and these 30 are really bad. Well, that, I'm over 60 now, but. So the point is, is that this idea that these little changes can add up and push things in one direction or the other is, is now what we're thinking about these small effects where the the basic meaning is okay, but maybe it affects, you know, how you carry out the, the, the command a little bit differently. And so the people who don't have um, the major changes, they have all these other genes that are normal, but may subtly increase the risk or not. And the reason maybe one person walks in with this set of symptoms is because they just have a few too many in the, that column and not enough to balance it. And so, so everybody really contributes to that kind of work. And of course, you know, uh, without the people who have this disease, these diseases, regardless of whether it's a major change in genetics or not, we really, all that improvement that Dr. Miller talked about in terms of how, how good we're getting at diagnosis, although we're not all there yet, is all due to the fact that people with these symptoms, genetic or otherwise, are, have been coming in for many years and continue to do so. And we have lots of uh, projects that are going to focus on that. So for instance, this collaboration with psychiatry is, uh, at least my, my view of it, a lot of it is about uh, the fact that because some of the symptoms of the disease we, we see are 
changes in social and emotional functions. People often get misdiagnosed with a psychiatric non-degenerative syndrome, and then only later we realize it's, it's not. It's one of these degenerative diseases. So we want to do a much better job at separating that, and that's an area of research that we haven't really dug into well enough yet, we as a community. So um, I'm, uh, now I'm going to invite Karen up to address a couple of questions more about diversity. Hello again. We only have two more questions about diversity. Hello. Yes, is it better? Yeah. One of them is, as you diversify the study population, will you be able to control for cultural and racial ethnic factors? The answer is yes. We still need a larger cohort of our diverse population. But once um, that grows, then we'll be able to co include statistical um, models that can help us um, to control for those factors. And um, but for right now, we're learning about our cohorts, as small as they are, but we're learning a lot. <laughs> And the other question is, how many Spanish speakers are involved in bringing Latinos to the research groups? And how many Chinese speakers for Chinese? How many total? We have um, full-time staff, um, a total of five bilingual and bicultural um, staff and faculty dedicated to working directly with the community. Two of us are Spanish speakers, and three um, of our colleagues who speak either Cantonese, Mandarin, and other th um, and three dialects, three Chinese dialects. Um, but I, I also want to, I mean, yes, we're, we're small, but um, I also want to em emphasize that uh, the MAC is, is a very collaborative team, so a lot of our research core coordinators who speak Spanish, for us, so who speak some Spanish, they help us out in um, doing community outreach. The care ecosystem also during their enrollment phase, they had a, a, another five research coordinators who were bilingual and bicultural and Cantonese and spe Spanish speakers. And also our, our colleagues, they always keep an eye on for potential participants who might be interested and even though they they don't speak Spanish they always say oh look I've met someone and I think they might be interested why don't you give them a call so it, it, it's an effort that the, the Mac as a community is, is is doing to try to bring in more diverse population but thank you all right Julio so uh the most questions came about treatment, but hopefully we've been able to group them into things that address a lot of people's uh, questions. And, and let, me, let me start by addressing some, an aspect of that question before uh, regarding the clinical implications or the, the ethical implications of having a study where there's a placebo. Uh, involved and and this is very important for us and we um, are trying to address it in, in different ways actively uh, I can tell you that our, our clinical trials program director thinks a lot about this and for us is about being fair for um, for people to have access to these uh, treatments and one of the things that we have decided and it's very clear for us is the modern trials the good trials right now all of them should offer a period of what we call open label treatment, which means at the beginning, the doctors don't know what drug, is, uh, what treatment is being used. The patients don't know if they're getting the placebo or the drug. But after, uh, at the end of the study, there's a phase where if patients are willing to, they have the option of getting the actual treatment. So it's fair for everyone even if they, at the beginning, they don't, they don't know whether they got the, the drug or the placebo at the, at the beginning, uh, at, the, at the end, they have access. And for us, this is fair, and we only participate in trials that have this sort of um, uh, design. And this applies also for phase one uh, trials. So, and then there are a couple of other things that we're trying to do actively to improve it. And, and this is, these are more on the testing uh, phases. One of them is, we know that you know, for someone who has a debilitating a degenerative disease, it's a burden to come to our center, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a production to bring them uh, to, uh, for the day to the clinic and get the treatment. It's, it's a big uh, and elaborate um, uh, process for a lot of families. So what, one thing we're trying is, in, in a, again, in the pilot phase, is we're trying to bring the treatments home. And we have one of our phase one studies is piloting what uh, the problems could be of actually treating the patients every month 
uh, at different locations. And we even have uh, patients that are being treated uh, remotely in, um, in, in, in other states, for example. And that was another question that, that, that I had. Do I need to be local to participate in the trials at the MAC? No. Uh, you can be from anywhere. We have patients flying from all over the place. It, it just comes down to whether you have the resources or not. We, we can uh, 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 sometimes uh, help uh, with part of it, but, but um, that's just a minor part. And then the other part that we're, we're thinking, and this is more of a future sort of uh, um, um, implementation, is we want to participate in modern, intelligent designs. For example, now we are designing trials, estimating that we're going to need, for example, 80 people or 100 people to see an effect. But now in the future, we expect that we'll be able to design trials that in real time, we are capturing the results and capturing effects, and we can modify our number of participants. Uh, so we, you know, we decrease the treatment, we shorten the, the, the experimental period, and hopefully in a faster uh, period of time, we'll be able to have results and, and hopefully share it with everyone. So that was one part of uh, the question I wanted to address. The, the other ones are very important questions. What are the side effects of aducanumab? There are two side effects of hydrocanumab, brain swelling and brain bruising. And the side effects are dose dependent. So you saw the highest dose of hydrocanumab is the most effective in treating the cognitive symptoms uh, or clearing amyloid. But it's also uh, the, hi the highest dose or um, the dose with the highest risk of side effects. Um, the low dose group has a 15% chance of developing changes. And the high dose group, uh, the highest group uh, dose, um, has a 50% chance of having uh, uh, changes in the brain. Most of these changes or most of these patients who develop side effects uh, are asymptomatic. We only know that the changes are happening because we are doing uh, routine MRIs to follow up and to look for the changes. But less than 6% or less than 5% of people actually develop symptoms. And what are the symptoms? It could be headache, it could be confusion, and there have been reports of seizures. But these are the minority of patients. So what we do, I can, I don't, uh, this data is from the phase one trial, and I don't know the data yet for this large trial, and we will uh, we'll share that when it's available. But I can tell you about our own experience. In our own experience, when we see um, um, uh, a side effect, uh, so far it's been uh, asymptomatic, and uh, we don't know uh, uh, what those that, that's uh, uh, related to. But the trial is designed in a way that if um, we see a side effect, we have either a whole period for a month or two and make sure that the change is stable. And then we can resume the, uh, uh, the original dose, or we can decrease the dose to a, a lower dose based on the severity of the change. Uh, and in, in, uh, there's a part of the protocol that says that if, if the change is too severe and asymptomatic, then we have to discontinue, but that hasn't happened yet. But it's, it's still work in progress, and I think there's more information that we're going to get about that. Um, if uh, aducanumab is effective, why don't give 10 milligrams of aducanumab to everyone? Uh, this is an experiment still. We're in the testing phase. The idea is to hopefully get information to make sure that the results can be generalized to the, all the population that has similar, a similar profile to the one that are included. And hopefully, you know, your doctor will be able to, to prescribe it. Uh, so that's the goal. Yeah. And another uh, another uh, question here. Yes. It is true. It is true. So doc, Dr. Rosen said, and this is this is uh, one of the questions I was uh, following up. Other drugs uh, uh, looks this promising, and then when we get the phase three trial uh, data, they don't work. And there are many reasons for that, but it's, it could still happen with this um, uh, medication. So that's why it's very important that we complete the trial and we wait until um, um, uh, we can, you know, make decisions about it. And that also applies for the other question, the uh, nutraceutical uh, products, uh, or are there other alternatives um, besides what is being tested by pharmaceutical companies? And the answer, again, from my point of view is no, I don't have any uh, um, data that, uh, to support whether you should continue taking a, a, a product or a, a her herbal medicine or uh, you should stop it, stop it or continue. All I ask and all I recommend is if you decide to go ahead and continue taking it, just let your doctors know. So if they're keeping track of your changes, keeping track of cognitive changes, or you develop a side effect from other medication, even though they, they don't know, they might factor in the possibility that is related to the, um, the nutraceutical effect or of the, the, the herbal medicine, uh, remedy. Um, we talk about this one, do I need to be local? No. And, um, Another one is, um, has an entity or a, a 
treatment being identified for um, cases in which there's more than one pathology, for example, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease? And that's, a, that's a, an important question. The answer is no. We know now that many of these diseases are not just one pathology. There's, uh, there's uh, uh, many cases in which we have uh, Alzheimer's disease mixed with something else, like could be Lewy bodies, or could be cerebrovascular disease. Um, and we don't know much about that. We don't know how how important it is uh, for treatment purposes to have many pathologies. And, and um, probably in the future we'll have, this is a question that is uh, start, starting to uh, rise as important and we, we're trying to look into it. Um, and what are, what are the alternative treatments for other the diseases uh, besides Alzheimer's disease and PSP, frontotemporal dementia, Lewy body disease, pig's disease? So far, we don't have uh, any treatment or any particular trial that, that will target these diseases, but we hope that um, you know, based on what Dr. Rosen has talked about, we are understanding the diseases better. We are now st starting to see uh, clear targets. I think we, before we were on a, on a fog, but now we have, we're identifying clear targets and we will be able to direct targets to those things. It's kind of far, hard to find something when you don't know what, what you're targeting. Um, yeah. I just want to make one little comment because I, I feel like this is a really important point about observational studies that don't specifically test a treatment and how important they are to treatment is this multiple pathologies idea. So one of the problems is when we see a person with some memory symptoms, we don't always know if they have other pathologies because pretty much the only ones we can see right now are amyloid for the last 10 years and tau for the last three or four years. And so every time we discover a new marker that tells us that there's some pathology in the brain, it helps us to address that question of, well, how would this treatment work in people who have might have multiple things going on in the brain? So we really, it, I, you know, it just stresses how important it is for people to participate in the research, like most of you, that doesn't necessarily involve drug treatment because of ultimately the drug treatments will not work as well if we don't know exactly who should get which drugs or maybe a combination of drugs. So the, a lot of the observational research, it has a major role in ultimately developing treatments. So, and, and all the people who have FTLD are good examples of that, where we still have a lot to learn about how to know which protein is bothering which person. Absolutely, yeah. Um. So it's a lot of these um, questions about uh, treatments for alternative treatments for alternative dementia forms. Again, uh, Lewy bodies and Pick's disease. Let me see another one here. Um, what is the name of the antibody for the PSP uh, trial? Uh, it's classified. No, I don't know. Uh, it has a weird name like number one zero zero P something, but we just call it we just call it um, the Abbey the AVI drug. There's another company that is publicly known uh, that has an antibody against our BMS. Uh, it's possible that the big other pharmaceutical companies will have antibodies soon and we'll see more, more of these trials uh, in the future. Um, and, and I think you know those will target uh, not only Alzheimer's disease but other diseases that have tau. You know PSP is one of them. We like PSP because it's a, it's, we think of it as a pure pathology. It's a pure disease where many cases don't have a big burden of the other pathologies. So we like studying it because we hope that if we can uh, uh, find out ways to uh, manipulate it or, change or exert a treatment uh, effect, we might be able to generalize easily to other diseases as opposed to starting with a very complex uh, disease with a lot of pathologies. If, we, it's, if it's effective, we will know if it's because it's acting on, on tau or another target that we're not identifying. So I think this is this is all I have now. I'm going to stop. Thank you so much. Oh, we're done. That's what it says. So um, thank you, everyone, very, very much again for uh, being here today, for participating in the research. We know we can't get to every question, certainly, or every topic that people want to get to every year. Again, if you put on your survey uh, things that you'd like to hear more about in the future, we, we'd be happy to uh, put something in about that, uh, especially if we hear it from multiple people. So. Right. If you have a specific question that relates to any of the work as individuals we do, you anybody you know at the Memory Center, if you say, I want to talk to this person and email us, all of our emails are also on the website. There's a kind of 
people part of the website, and there's those little envelopes, and you can click on the little envelope, and it'll open up an email to us. And you're welcome to email any of us with questions, and do it a second time if we don't answer right away. All right. Thank you very, very much for coming in. We hope it was useful, and we'll see you again in lots of places.